bit here from that, okay? Um, I, I'm not a scholar on positive uh, organizational studies or, or a scholarship or anything else like that organizations. I'm an operations guy. So all I can offer you is an operations guy perspective on positive business. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. And the, and the orientation that I come to this with is kind of a reaction to the people that see positive as negative, right? There, there, and there are plenty of them out there. And usually the argument goes something like this, that positive is some kind of an add-on to business. It's an, a, a distraction. It's something that one has a responsibility to do that, that uh, interferes with the fundamental objectives of business. And if so, you know, we shouldn't do it. Right? Now, I kind of agree with that, but I don't agree with the assumption that it is external or that it is in opposition to uh, the fundamental objectives of business. And because business fundamentals involve operations, there's no such thing as a successful organization that doesn't have successful operations. The road to positive runs through operations. And so I want to talk about that part of the path to positive. And to do so, let me start by just defining what operations management is. Um, Basically, here's a quick definition. It basically says that we focus on processes that provides, provide goods and services to customers. Okay? Um, now, what I'd like to do is give you a few minutes here of what does the inside of an operations guy's brain look like. Okay? And then after you've been sufficiently terrorized by that, then we can turn around and talk about what does that mean for, for positive. Okay? So, Delivering goods and services to customers. There's no such thing as an, op as an organization that doesn't do that, so therefore all organizations have operations, right? You can't build the pyramids without operations management. You can't send a man to the moon without operations management. You can't make a movie about sending a man to the moon without operations. Any uh, product that you buy has behind it a, a stream of production and distribution and delivery and inventory and quality control processes that facilitate that product reaching you. The same thing is true for any service you experience. Okay? Now, the operations differ in terms of the context, but the basic challenge of, of delivering uh, uh, the goods and services to customers is fundamentally the same. And a core concern the place where a lot of operations policies originate is with the concept of efficiency. Okay? Efficiency is all about maximizing value with minimum resources. Right? And who would object to that? Right? Because if you're a, a, a business, uh, a competitive business seeking to be profitable, the ability to deliver value you know, with uh, minimal resources is going to affect your profitability. Okay? If you're a nonprofit, um, then you want to maximize the impact you have on the world with the funds you have available. And again, efficiency is all about doing just that. So efficiency is a central concern. We often call it better, faster, cheaper. Right? That's kind of what we focus on in the operations world. But the reality is that um, you, know, you experience uh, systems every day that don't deliver this. Let me give you an illustration. Let me first show you um, a, uh, an operation that is... Oops. Damn it, that didn't go the right way. There we go. Okay, so here we are. This is, watch the customers get their value efficiently in this system. Okay, nobody's waiting for anything. Okay, everybody's busy working on stuff that customers want. Just like the Seagull Cafe, right? Okay. I communicated the order to the provider and it's delivered instantaneously. Things are clocking along. Okay. All right. So that's efficient. Okay. It doesn't always go that way. In contrast. Uh, Seinfeld, uh, you made a reservation for a mid-size, and she's a small. <laughs> I'm kidding around, of course. Um, okay, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry, we have no mid-size available at the moment. I don't understand, I made a reservation. Do you have my reservation? Yes, we do. Unfortunately, we ran out of cars. But the reservation keeps the car here. That's why you have the reservation. I know why we have reservations. I don't think you do. 
If you did, I'd have a car. <laughs> See, you know how to take the reservation, you just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the reservation, the holding. Anybody can just take it. <laughs> Let me uh, speak with my supervisor. Okay. Look. Any of that look familiar? Okay. Lots of work going on there, people getting paid, resources being used, no customer value being delivered. Okay, that's the antithesis of, of efficiency. Okay, because efficiency is so central to uh, organizational performance, it's been a concern for virtually ever, right? If you look at the uh, marvels of antiquity here, these things could not have been pulled off without some very impressive operations management, right? If you couldn't marshal the, a, a lot of resources, you simply couldn't build these kinds of things. But the operations in, in ancient times were really implicit, right? They, they were just part of getting a job done, right? You just worked out what had to be done. It wasn't a form, it wasn't, certainly wasn't a profession at that point in time, and, it's, and it wasn't an e explicit consideration of business until the Industrial Revolution, okay? In the Industrial Revolution, uh, there were a host of technological innovations, automation, that uh, elevated the productivity of workers to the point where they could produce vastly more value you know, per hour spent uh, and transformed the former uh, uh, domestic production system, the craft guilds, into the factory system that we all know and maybe love today. Um, and this system, which was started in uh, 18th century Britain, was carried over to the U.S., Illegally, I might uh, um, note. This is Samuel Slater, the trader, as he's known in the UK. Uh, he um, stole a lot of the, he was a textile worker in the UK, stole a lot of the plans and, uh, uh, um, you know, industrial secrets, brought them over to the US and started the first modern uh, factory in the US, uh, which was, uh, you know, sort of the first step in creating the so-called American system of manufacturers. Uh, this part was mostly uh, replicating what the Brits had already done. The second part was interchangeable parts, right? And I want to note that the, this is a different kind of an efficiency uh, innovation because it's not a technological breakthrough, but rather a managerial breakthrough. But prior to, to uh, Whitney's work uh, on musket production, basically muskets were produced like an artisan would produce it. A barrel fit a gun. It didn't fit any gun. It fit one gun. And so an artisan had to produce the whole gun, you know, uh, together, uh, you know, in a very slow and tedious fashion. What uh, Whitney did was by holding the tolerances on the individual parts to tight enough uh, extents that you could use any uh, barrel or any uh, flintlock mechanism or any uh, uh, stock for any musket, what now you could do is separate out the work into, you know, tasks and have people be, you know, making barrels as opposed to making muskets. And by dividing that up and then taking advantage of scale, um, you could achieve levels of efficiency that nobody had pri uh, seen prior to that. Okay? That then uh, led to this American system which grew in scale and uh, then with the advent of the railroads and the telegraphs that made mass distribution and hence mass production uh, economical led to large-scale productions that were way too large to be run by like a single shop foreman like had been done in the textile industry. So on the scene comes the sort of uh, first apostle of efficiency. It was uh, Frederick W. Taylor who was responsible for the scientific management movement, which was all about efficiency. And if you read his work, he's got all kinds of work standards about how much gravel a guy should shovel in a 12-hour day and all this kind of stuff in his writings. But basically, what he was after was systematically studying uh, operations uh, from an efficiency standpoint. And that was a, a, an absolute revelation because now, all of a sudden, you know, efficiency becomes a, a profession. But it's even bigger than that. He was really the first person to propose the idea that management itself could be studied. So the first business schools, the first industrial engineering departments were all founded on Taylorism. And so he's, in some sense, our intellectual father for all of us in, in this field. Um, now, he didn't focus, though, very much on the individual details of work. Some of his, uh, his uh, uh, followers did, however. So these are the Gilbreths, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Uh, I don't know if you know who they are, but they, they um, uh, were the sort of first practitioners of time and motion studies. Frank owned a brick uh, laying company, a construction company, and what he did was he was worried about every little motion that uh, the, the bricklayers did. 
And by studying and breaking down their work into tiny little motions and eliminating all the sort of useless stuff and, you know, developing a moving scaffold to, you know, reduce the reach uh, of the workers, he was more efficient than anybody else in the industry and just cleaned up. But he and his wife, you know, were consultants and did lots of this kind of ergonomic, uh, you know, time study kind of stuff for people um, in all kinds of different industries. He's also known as one of his, their children wrote the book Cheaper by the Dozen because they had 12 kids and they used all their efficiency stuff in the household. So you had work standards for how to take a shower, right? You know, so forth. So. This is true, right? They wrote that anyway. So there is a modern uh, movie of this, like with Steve Martin. Is a, it's a stupid movie of a football coach and all that stuff. That has nothing to do with this, right? The whole funny part of the book is the fact that it's an, an industrial engineer, you know, running his family like a factory, which is funny about it. Anyway, um, so one of the leading uh, adopters of scientific management and who carried this efficiency game to sort of untold heights was Henry Ford with the famous moving assembly line, you know, here uh, in, in Highland Park in 1913. Uh, and that sort of took this standardized parts, division of labor, you know, to uh, a, a new level and reduced the cost of an automobile by, you know, like a factor of 10 over the years that it was, um, was implemented. Um, and, of course, he made, you know, gobs and gobs of money doing this as well. We'll come back to Ford in a little bit. But Ford and his system was the basis for the lean that I wanted to talk about today. And Taichi Ono, the architect of the Toyota production system, uh, uh, explicitly recognized Ford's contributions and that he was building on those uh, as part of the system that he crafted to try to bring Toyota into competitiveness with the other big auto manufacturers. And at this point, Toyota is by far the most imitated company in the world, right? They're, you go to any automotive company anywhere and they're practicing some elements of the Toyota production system. You go to any manufacturing system today and you will find it. You go to any hospital today and you'll find them talking about lean, which is the sort of generic term for the Toyota production system. So what is it? Well, at its core, it's all about waste reduction. It's about efficiency, right? So basically anything that doesn't add value or help meet customer requirements or that customers wouldn't pay for is considered waste or muda because it sounds a lot more sort of, you know, exotic if you call it muda than if you call it waste. But um, getting rid of muda is kind of the, the, the uh, you know, sort of center of what lean is all about. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's kind of the... the, the trick, right? So everybody in the world has, has um, you know, uh, benchmarked Toyota and looked at their factories, and yet Toyota managed to maintain a, a productivity lead, an efficiency lead for about 40 years, despite being scrutinized so heavily, which is kind of an interesting, uh, you know, uh, thing to speculate about is, well, what is it, right? Because the, the sort of mechanical parts of it are pretty easy to see and copy, but there must be something more to it uh, that's going on that makes it less easy to copy. And we'll talk a little bit about what that might be. Now, what do we do as academics who study this kind of stuff? Well, what we look at is the underlying mechanics of production and service systems to try to identify uh, behaviors that can lead us to levers for improvement. How do we identify what's causing the muda or the waste and, and trace that you know, to its causes in a systematic way so that we can you know, continually improve uh, efficiency? And what we typically study are networks because all of, of uh, you know, all systems, operating systems, really consist of some kind of series of processes that are connected together. And so those form a network. And the network might be a factory with stuff flowing through it. It might be a, a bank with, you know, financial transactions flowing through it. It might be a hospital with patients flowing through it. But they're all flows. And by understanding those flows, um, we can... Uh, you know, discover ways to manage them better and better. So that's what we teach our students. We, we talk about all this kind of stuff, these flows and so forth. Now, one thing I want to show you, I put the copy, uh, cover of my book on there for a reason. Notice that the title is not factory fun, right? It's not factory psychology. It's not factory religion. It's factory physics. That's the perspective that operations people take first and foremost on the world. We start with the physics of the flow, right? Not the community or any of those other kinds of things. Now, there is a hint on the cover there, maybe a cry for help or whatever it is, but Charlie Chaplin's on here, right, from Modern Times, which is a movie about the dehumanizing aspects of the factory system, right, and, and the consequences, right? So, so that's in there, but no operation would start there. Uh, operations person would start with people. They would always start with physics. Let me get, illustrate what those physics are, and we'll get to people 
eventually. So here's a, a fundamental principle of, of factory physics or operations management. It says that any flow with variability must be buffered by some combination of capacity, time, and inventory. And this applies whether it's a flow of parts through factories or supply chains or people through hospitals. All of those flows will observe this physics. Okay? Now, what do I mean by variability? Well, variability is anything that causes your system to depart from clock-like uniformity. Right? So we saw that little you know, uh, deli there. With every, notice everybody came in, spaced exactly evenly, moving at the same pace. Right? The guys that were delivering the you know, sandwiches were working at a constant pace. So everything, the supply and the demand, lined up, and nobody had to wait and no capacity ever went unused, right? There was no waste in that system, right? So that was a system in which there wasn't variability, and so there wasn't waste caused by it, because every one of those buffers is a form of waste. If you've got capacity that's not being used, waste, right? If you've got time, customers waiting for whatever it is they want, that's waste, okay? If there's inventory sitting there unused, you're paying for it, it's waste, right? All of those things are, are waste. Now, I'd like to you know, sort of put your inventory buffering strategy out into some kind of a diagram diagrammatic uh, 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 picture here. And you can see the, the vert vertices of this triangle are, are representing the situation where all of the variability in the system is buffered by one thing. So all inventory or all capacity or all time. But in reality, we, we see multiple forms of buffers. So let me illustrate by means of uh, restaurants, okay? So here's McDonald's, okay? McDonald's has variability in its demand. Because we walk in and, you know, order our lunch whenever we want to, right? We don't make reservations. They don't schedule us. We don't go in like the people in that deli, right, all lined up in, you know, nice uniform rows. Uh, we walk in whenever we want to. So there's variability in that system, and there's some variability in terms of the processing, you know, how, how you know, what you order is going to influence how long it takes to actually womp up your lunch. But McDonald's, so they don't want time as a buffer, right? To be down toward this this end would be bad because, hey, it's fast food, right? And if it isn't fast, people aren't going to go there, right? You're not going for the ambience. You're going for the speed. Anyway, McDonald's plays two games. One is they have enough capacity, and they study this kind of stuff at Hamburger U to decide how many you know, clerks do they need to have to meet the lunchtime rush. So they're worrying about how much to buffer with capacity. But they're also making hamburgers in advance and putting them on a warming table. And that's inventory, right? And that speeds things up because you can go in and they can go, boom, put it in a bag and give it to you. Now, Burger King, okay, if you're old like me, you remember, you know, hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us, right? You have it your way? Yeah. Well, Burger King, oops, I don't want to go to Denny's yet. Um, it's, uh, Burger King is basically trying to stay away from the inventory thing, right? Because they can't hold the pickles, hold the lettuce if the thing's already bagged up on the warming table. So what they're doing is saying, look, we're not going to have so much inventory. We're not out here. We're going to buffer with capacity. Now, they have to have more capacity, right? They have to have more staffing or faster machines uh, than McDonald's has to have to provide the same level of speed in order to avoid that inventory strategy, right? Because they're never going to have the option of grabbing one off the, uh, the warming table, okay? So they're over here. Now, Denny's, in comparison, is a restaurant that has a broader menu, and so more variability in terms of what the customers are asking for. So they got to buffer that. So they could play these games of having jillions and jillions of, of breakfasts and so forth, you know, whipped up on a warming table, not very, you know, appealing. Um, they could have enormous staffing, but then their prices would be high. So what they do is they sit you down and have you wait, right? Give you some coffee and you order and so forth, right? So, um, so there are different strategies even within the same business. But, okay, so that, that, that said, if you have variability, you will have waste. You can choose your poison, but you can't get rid of it unless you reduce the variability. And that is the magic dust of lean. If you can shrink that triangle, if you can make the variability less, through your actions, you can make the buffering requirements less, and you can reduce the waste, right? And so then we're right back to the old efficiency game is played through variability reduction. And that's a huge part of what goes on in lean or any other uh, operations uh, effort focused on efficiency. How do they do it at reservations, right? Or at, at, at a restaurant, you know? You have to get, make a reservation, right? Uh, in that by virtue of having reservations, you, you know, don't come in in all kinds of bursts and, you know, fits and spurts. So they've leveled out that, that demand variability in, in the restaurant. That's a variability reduction. Now, that kind of game can be played all kinds of places, right? You, you don't just walk into your dentist's office. You make an appointment, right? Hopefully, you know, um, all kinds of other things, including emergency rooms. Here's an example. 
you can go to inquicker.com and you can make a reservation to go to the emergency room. Now, that might seem kind of contradictory to the purpose of an emergency room, but it turns out that most people that go to emergency rooms are not actually emergent, right? So if you cut your finger and you can wait until you're seen by a doctor, you could go in now, have a six-hour wait, and you know, have somebody see you, or you could go to in quicker, get a reservation, it's just like getting a fast pass at Disney World, and then you can go in, and if they don't teach, treat you within 20 minutes, you get, like, free movie tickets or something like that. There's some kind of prize that the, um, that the uh, emergency departments give you, okay? But one of the things I want to do here is I want to make this stuff up close and personal to us here. We practice this stuff here at the Raw School, right? So, yes, we do have things like appointments, right? So you don't just walk into, you know, OCD and say, I want, uh, you know, career counseling. You make an appointment. There's a variability reduction technique. But we also have identical setups. When I plugged into this, you know, uh, um, you know uh, podium here for my computer, it was exactly the same setup that I have in any classroom that I would teach here at Ross, right? Because that, you know, limits the variability that I would have if I had to do something different. We try to reduce the variability in terms of the classroom experience by having prerequisites, right? If the student background is all over the place, right, it's impossible for us to efficiently teach things without leveling that out. We even go further in some of our programs, EMBA, WMBA, we have lockstep programs where everybody has to take the same classes in the same room at the same times as everybody else so we know exactly how many students are going to sign up for what, right? And it makes things very efficient. Right? Now you can ask the question of what about quality, and there's always that tension between you know, stamping out all the variability and stamping out all the quality of the experience. Right? So you've got to mediate that, uh, that trade-off. But variability reduction is absolutely central to operations management. And in the Toyota production system, if you look at what the tools are inside of it, a whole bunch of those can be treated or, or viewed as nothing more than variability reduction. Total quality management. Every time you make a mistake and have to fix it, it induces variability. So you try to drive that out. Standardized work processes so that everybody does the same task in the same way. Right? Production smoothing so you level out workloads. Total preventive maintenance so machines don't fail and cause variability. Pokey oak is a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 sort of an idiot proofing technique for preventing errors from happening in the first place. Kanban is a flow control technique. Jidoka is a, you know, a, a technique for uh, addressing quality at the source. And so on and so forth. Quali you can look at Toyota's last 40 years as one grand experiment in driving out variability in all its uh, you know, shapes and sizes. Now, how do you do it organizationally, though, right? It's all fine and good to say that's what you're after, but how do you do it, right? Do you do it like this, right? This is uh, time for me to... They say a picture's worth a thousand words, so a video must be worth, what, a hundred thousand? Okay, so here's, here's a, a... Oops, I didn't get to the right one. There we go, okay. So here's the top-down approach. Okay, there you go. Eliminating all forms of variability, including children's ages. Um, so what do you think? Think that's pretty effective for the uh, you know, senior management to order it? Probably not, right? Probably not. Uh, aside from the fact that you probably don't want to uh, you know, live in San Marcos. Um, the reality is that the, the sources of waste and variability in any given organization are so vast, are so varied, that it's impossible. It's like trying, you know, the Russian five-year programs, you know, that, that never worked, because it's impossible to pick out, you know, the, the right things to focus on. So instead of, of the top-down approach, the really effective uh, uh, lean transformations you see in industry all work bottom-up. 
right? That it's, it's a matter of engaging the workforce, the people who are actually doing the work, to identify the ideas, the options, the possibilities for uh, you know, reducing waste in their own local um, parts of the business. And indeed, if you look back at the Toyota production system, the one that I didn't talk about was Kaizen. Kaizen is exactly that. Kaizen is this continual improvement process in which people within the organization are engaged in sort of uh, spurts of improvements. And, and the idea is that they work together in teams in sort of focused uh, uh, efforts to try to uh, eliminate problems throughout the organization, and then you just keep on doing that. But the idea is that you, you know, engage the, the people there. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. That, that, that's my primer on operations. Now you know everything that you need to know about how an operations person brain works. What I've told you is that all organizations rely on operations, that efficiency is essential to virtually any strategy you care to name for a, a, an organization, that waste elimination is an ongoing challenge that is served by eliminating variability because it's such a prominent source of waste. And finally, finally, driving out variability and waste is a complex activity that requires the brains of lots and lots of different people, okay? And finally, the people word has come up, right? And that's about, you know, par for the course in an operations guy's view of the world is that here we are, you know, whatever, 20 minutes into the thing, and finally we've mentioned people, right? But the reality is that this is where the $64,000 question comes up, which is, are these in opposition with each other, right? What I've talked to you about is efficiency, right? And I've argued that it's absolutely essential and it's not going away, right? And if positive means dispensing with efficiency, guess who's going to lose, right? It's got to be that these two work together. But they are different. They are not the same thing. This is about, you know, eliminating the, the, the uh, bad things, right? Whereas this is about building up the good things. And it's not that both of those aren't reasonable things to do, right? You remember the song, right? Accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, right? Latch on to the affirmative, but don't mess around with Mr. In-Between, right? Um, anyway, that's, that's the song. Um, anyway, so what I want to explore here is the question of, are these things really working in opposition? And I think in some contexts, they are, right? But then the, the bigger, higher level question is, can they work in cooperation with one another? And if so, how? And I'll give you some thoughts, but at that point, I'm going to be sort of lost and looking for your help. So get ready. Um, Here's, here's the fundamental issue, okay? We have been focusing on efficiency since the Industrial Revolution and we've made enormous progress, right? Product, labor productivity goes up and up and up and up, right? And what this means is that each person can generate a higher level of value per hour that they expend due to investments in automation and better management practices and all those kinds of things, right? At the same time, if you're in an industry such as the automotive industry where demand is not growing, what do you think the logic, if you do the math, right, and you take this and add it to this, what's happening to employment? It's going down. If you go into, when I started my career 30 years ago, I went into a plant, you know, an auto assembly plant. That plant might have 1,200 workers. Today that plant has less than 400 workers. And they're putting out more uh, cars than they ever did in the days 30 years ago. Okay? So that means there's a lot less jobs for that. Efficiency gains are destructive to employment. They just are. That's part of the, the reason for them. And as a result, you know, uh, the, there is a conflict here, right? On one hand, we're basically saying engage the workforce to eliminate waste, and at the same time, you know, basically we're talking about efficiency that is going to lead to less employment in the system. It's not just that, though. You'd think, well, but they're more profitable, so those workers at least are better off. Not necessarily, right? Look at these statistics. Since 1960 here, the uh, percent of GDP that has gone to after-tax corporate profits was pretty steady up to the 90s, and since then has been growing and indeed has cracked the 10% barrier for the first time ever, right? So this is, a, is sort of uncharted territory. At the same time, the percent of GDP going to personal wage and salary income has been trending down. So it seems as though these uh, uh, efficiency efforts are actually leading the, the profits, the gains, to go more heavily toward ownership than towards labor. And believe me, labor knows it, right? I mean, you know it if you're, you know, feeling this. And, and so, you know, the uh, movements we've seen in recent years and so forth are, are, are not accidental. There are some, some statistics behind it, okay? Now, let's make it a little bit more personal, okay? Waste elimination is good. Who would argue for waste? Well, okay, let's, let's you know, champion waste. We should be more wasteful, right? That's obviously not a path we're going to go down. So uh, waste uh, elimination is good, but what if that waste is me, right? 
the law school could be you know, much more efficient if they could just get rid of me. I cost a lot, right? And so, um, you know, if they could provide every service that they provide. Now, that's actually the equation that's being considered in lots of, of instances. Now, in general, they'll go, well, well, he's pretty old. He'll retire pretty soon. So we really don't have to kick him out. We'll just replace him with, you know, some kind of, a, you know, a technician or something when, you know, he retires and we'll cut our costs. And you think that won't happen. Here's an article or a, a column from the New York Times about 10 days ago that Thomas Friedman uh, put out in which he quoted Clay Christensen, a Harvard pro, uh, business professor, saying the Harvard Business School doesn't teach entry-level accounting anymore because there's a professor out at Brigham Young University whose online accounting course is just so good that Harvard students use that instead. So, whew, I don't teach accounting, I'm safe, right? You know? No. And this isn't new, right? We did this at Northwestern years ago when I was there. We basically made financial accounting a prerequisite and said, take it online. They didn't take it from Brigham Young. They took it from Berkeley. But it was happening even then. Okay? So there is a, a, an efficiency move happening in our own industry, right? And we could choose to respond to it just like GM responded to Toyota. Who oh, those little junky Japanese cars. They would never threaten us. Yeah? This kind of stuff not going to threaten us? Yeah? You want to bet on it? Um, so I've been walking around the school lately in my uh, capacities uh, and, and challenging people to think about efficiency in our context. And the, the uh, you know, metric that I like to talk about is dollars per student credit hour. So assume that quality measured by all the things you would measure, you know, uh, student satisfaction, performance on tests, placement in industry and so forth. Assume that those are, are held to the absolute highest level, that there's no compromise there. And ask yourself the question of, you know, can we reduce this? Okay. Now, the, the, that's a reasonable question given that, you know, people are becoming more and more sensitive to tuition increases and the, the double-digit tuition increases we've seen in this industry over, over the past number of decades are not happening anymore. And so if we don't moderate costs, then we're going to find ourselves in exactly the same position of being undermined by a lower cost uh, competitor. Now, you can rewrite that as... Uh, you know, sort of dollars per FTE, full-time equivalent. So I'm talking faculty and staff, all the people we employ, right, on top, and student credit, credit hours per FTE on the bottom. And that bottom measure is a measure of, measure of productivity, right? How many students do you teach, right? How many, and, and we have actually been um, using the top-down approach, the, the San Marcos dictator approach, to influence this, this bottom one for decades. And the way we've done it, class sizes have been getting bigger, right? When Paul was here, I bet you didn't see many classes of 85 students, you know, in, in the, the MBA level classes, right? You do now. They're all there, right? That was one way that we bumped this up, right? But we're, we're kind of reaching the limits to, you know, where we can go with that without really degrading quality of the experience. So then what's left? Well, what's left is technology, right? MOOCs, you know, uh, uh, screencasting, peer-to-peer uh, you know, -peer collaborative uh, software, uh, and a whole host of other things that are emerging that you see all over the media now that are basically screaming that this is where things are going to go. But there's no way that you could do that from the top down and, and mandate without picking all the wrong stuff, right? If the administration said, all right, we're all going to do this many video lectures and we're going to use this technology, it'd be a mess, right? So the only way it's going to happen is if the faculty, um, you know, adopt these things, experiment, and develop them themselves. So how much, you know, uh, a positive uh, reaction do you suppose I've gotten to my suggestions that we do that? Yeah. We'll round off. 0.0, .0 would be a good estimate, right? Um, anyway, none, right? Faculty don't want to do this, right? And, um, you know, the, the reasons that they give, are they're, they're not atypical, right? This, is, this goes on in every industry. I'm just trying to make it personal. This affects us. Is that, you know, we don't want to change. Nobody wants to change. We know how to do what we do. Two, that, you know, that the lowering the cost is a bad objective. We shouldn't be doing that, right? Because price signals quality in this, in this business. So we want to be the Maserati of education. So therefore, we want to be expensive. Does that mean we want to be high cost? That's not so clear. Anyway, um, but... So, so we're facing the very same kind of resistance that's gone on for centuries, right? In the Industrial Revolution, the Luddites smashed the textile machinery, okay? In the uh, uh, early 20th century in scientific management, workers struck over the idea of, of having standardized work uh, procedures. And in, in this case, Watertown Arsenal was one of Taylor's plants. Uh, they got a congressional committee to intervene, and they actually banned stopwatches from use in this plant, right? So there was plenty of resistance. And it goes on today in lean, right? You can go into the literature. Here's a you know, semi-respectable journal of applied psychology 
with a paper basically decrying all the negative uh, uh, impacts of the work of, of lean practices on the workers. Now, you probably can't read this, but it basically says that uh, reduced organizational commitment and increased job depression. And they're basically making the same kind of arguments that the Luddites and the you know, people opposed to scientific management did, that this is dehumanizing, that the lean practices are, are driving workers uh, in ways that are, are harmful. Okay? So this goes, this goes on today. So this leads us now to the, to the question that I, uh, that I really wanted us to talk about, which is, can efficiency... Uh, and worker welfare complement one another. Are there any paths under which these two things can actually uh, coexist in, in a mutually uh, beneficial way? And let's see. I have a couple of, of observations. I'll tell you a couple of stories of people that I've observed that I've been impressed with and then ask you for, for your thoughts on it. Well, one approach is just share the gain, right? Obviously, somebody's making a lot of money by this, right? If you can uh, have innovations that produce more value with less cost, then there's more profit to be spread around. Now, I just showed you some statistics that suggest that it's not being shared around uh, very uh, well to the workforce, but it could be, and it used to be, right? Henry Ford was actually quite um, you know, innovative on this part, now, uh, the reason I'm from Michigan is both my grandfathers came here to work for Henry Ford because he was paying $5 a day when 220 or 230 was a good wage. Uh, and so a lot of people came here. Now, that was, economists would call that an efficiency wage, right, and that, it, that he's paying to hang on to people because one of the problems they had when they introduced the early assembly line was the work was so mind-numbingly dull that people quit all the time and they had terrible you know, sort of uh, productivity in terms of just getting people up to speed. So to keep them, they paid a lot more money. And then they did keep them, and they got good people to come. But what Ford did uh, was argue that this is really part of the, um, the, the responsibility of business. And he did so even when he got sued, right? He got sued by the Dodge brothers, one of, uh, a pair of his major investors in the early days, because they said he was not distributing enough of the profits in the form of dividends, right? And instead of arguing that, of saying, look, I'm reinvesting in the, you know, the system and so forth, now, there's a backstory to this. The Dodge guys, the brothers were trying to introduce a competitive car to Ford, and they were trying to stop him from investing in his business. And so there's lots of ulterior motives. But what Ford did is instead of just going and saying, I'm investing in the business, he went down this road of saying that, you know, things like our first job is to make good products, second is to pay a good wage, and he hasn't mentioned the shareholders yet. He got in trouble, and they ruled against him, and he wound up having to pay the Dodge brothers. Nevertheless, Ford argued to the end of his life, that, um, you know, that, that employment and uh, worker welfare was essential to the success that Ford had and that departing from that would have been a terrible business uh, decision. Now, in more modern days in um, Ford, I got a second story. Uh, and this guy is Joe Henricks. He's an um, executive VP. He's the number three man at Ford at this point. But I got to know jo uh, um, uh, Joe a long time ago when he was a, a very young plant manager. So what uh, Joe was identified, he was working at GM, actually, in the early days, and he was pegged as a, as a sort of high performer. And they sent him to Harvard Business School, and he came back and was a plant manager at the age of 28. And um, they, uh, Harvard wrote up a case of his experience with that first plant at 28. And one of the things that Joe did, and the story of this case, it's called GM Powertrain, if you want to read it, it's still available through Harvard, um, is they had a strike at GM, as they were wont to do at GM, right? And the typical practice for plant managers is to shut down, lay everybody off, right? Because eventually you're going to wind up with that anyway. If some brake plant goes on strike, the assembly plants can't move, they shut down. All the other parts plants don't have anything to ship, so they shut down. And Joe, at 28 years old, said, I'm not going to shut down. I'm not going to shut down. I'm going to keep running, and we're going to you know, do some improvements in the plant, and do some preventive maintenance. And he kept everybody working, right? So this is early into his, his first management assignment, he did that. And um, it's interesting that, that he thought that this would be important, because this is back in the days when the UAW had the jobs bank program, and the laid-off workers made 95% of their full wage for sitting around doing nothing. And yet, Joe believed that the workers wanted to work, and that being laid off was, was a sign of disrespect. It was, it was a sign of a lack of appreciation. And he wanted to show them that he believed in them, and he bucked the trend to keep them working through this strike. Well, after that, Joe could do no wrong. He like, you know, walked on water with them and uh, was, was very successful. Some of his, and so basically what I would have him do 
is talk to my classes. I bring him in. I'd have taught him all the physics junk that I just told you about, right? And then he'd come in and he'd say, here's how, you know, I, I get things done. And he, by that time, over the course of when he was coming into my class, he managed four different plants. Every single plant he took over was at the bottom of the Harbor Report, which is this extensive study of automotive plant efficiency. And by the time he left, maybe 18 months maximum, two years later, they were at the top of the Harbor Report, right? So he just transformed those. But what he would always come in and say was, he would tell us about the performance of the plant that he had managed four years ago, that he had left, and point out, it's still at the top. I haven't been there in years, and that plant is still running. That was the thing he was most proud of. But the process that he went through is he said, first of all, basically, he told people, look, we don't turn this place around, we're all out of business, right? So this doesn't sound very positive, but it was the reality of the shared vision because nobody was going to make any more money on this. And as a matter of fact, the second thing he told them is he gave them some training in the finance, right? Automotive plants are cost centers, right? That, that the way that they meet their budget is by avoiding overtime. The biggest reason an auto plant is going to look horrible is because you don't, you know, you have quality problems, you have production problems or whatever, and you have to run overtime to make your numbers, your budget's going to look horrible. So what, what Joe is doing is he's showing them that. He's giving a little bit of training in how, you know, variability. If your tool's in the wrong place and you have to go looking for this, the line shuts down, how much does that actually affect, you know, the performance of the plant? So they all know it, right? But now he's got to convince them to work against their interest, Right? Because if they mess up, they get paid overtime. And they made a lot of money on overtime. But somehow, you know, he assumes that people do want to work here. Right? And so uh, ever since, Joe has been like the lead negotiator with the UAW because he actually never disses these guys. When he talks about union workers, when he talks about them, you know, he treats them with respect, which is not actually very common in this industry. You know, the, the showing trust of keeping the plant moving during the strike, he would look for opportunities to show that he actually did trust them as parts of the team. He had visible metrics. Basically, he would send out pager uh, messages, good work, team six, you've set a new record, and he would send that out to the whole plant, uh, you know, sort of uh, acknowledging them, and then celebrate success. He would go in and serve, you know, dinners and things like that to uh, workers, uh, you know, on all three shifts after they'd made some uh, milestone. And finally, investing for the long term. Right? So part of that GM powertrain case was there was a decision about whether or not to make an expensive investment uh, in, in something that was going to actually pay off well after he was gone from the plant. And he argued, you know, hard to make that investment and, and um, you know, has done so throughout his career. Anyway, so this list of things somehow, you know, maybe you can discern a bit more of the magic dust th than I can, somehow uh, every time Joe was in charge of a plant, he gained the trust of his workers and the results were, were tangible there. Um, okay. Let me give you one that I understand a little bit better here. And this is another guy I used to bring into my classes. Uh, his name is Dennis Kessler, and he was co-president of a company called Felpro, which made gaskets for automotive applications. And um, what Dennis did is uh, it was a family-owned business, and he would come in and talk about the um, employee benefits that they offered at Felpro. And they consisted of stuff like this, okay? So profit sharing, flexible work hours, bonuses, recognitions for holidays and milestones, graduations, that kind of stuff. On-site subsidized daycare, college scholarships. At this time, this was in the 90s, $14,000 per child in-home tutoring for employee children, a summer camp that the kids could go to all summer long, and employee forum with the delegate from every area of the business uh, that had inputs into all this stuff, right? And so whenever he presented this stuff to the students, they would go, man, are you a philanthropist? This is so great. You're such an activist. And his response is always, no, I'm not. I'm a greedy capitalist pig. And then he would proceed to tell us how the investments in all of these uh, employee benefits netted him a 300% return on that uh, investment. And the focus was primarily on turnover. They had no turnover at this place. I mean, the employees stayed there and worked for life, which is very uncommon in this day and age. Uh, and uh, the productivity rates were very high. And so he would just compare to industry averages and say, look at the cost of training that I'm avoiding. Look at the cost of quality that I'm avoiding. Look at the productivity levels that I am achieving here. And you know, attribute those to uh, the investments. Okay. So he had, you know, in this case, done a little bit like what Henry Ford had done by just paying people more, but instead of just paying them in the form of salary, he had done it in the form of benefits that people really valued. So 
And I, I should point out that, you know, the, the uh, performance on all the metrics that we would use for efficiency were outstanding at Felpro. And as a result, Dennis sold the company for a, you know, pile of money. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully these practices are still in place under federal mogul who bought it. The last one I want to throw out, and the, the one that, that, you know, resonates with me most strongly, is this idea of cultivating a sense of higher purpose, right? That at the end of the day, making money only carries us so far, right? That, that um, you know, if Carl Icahn or whoever the big, you know, uh, money bags who owns, you know, stock in my company makes a few thousand dollars more from, you know, his, his stake in the company, I don't know how much that motivates me as a worker inside the company. So typically, you see firms that really exhibit, you know, ex extremely good performance along these you know, efficiency lines are people that are motivated by something bigger than just that. So, for instance, um, you know, Steve Jobs' famous, uh, you know, recruitment pitch to, to John Scully, right? Do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life or do you want to join me and change the world, right? And if you read about, you know, the things that Apple did in the early days, the Macintosh project, the workers killed themselves over this. And it wasn't for any personal gain there. It was for a sense of passion that they were really doing something that was changing the world, right? And that's pretty highly motivating. Um, you know, a, a company like Patagonia, which was founded, you know, by um, a, a climber, right? A, you know, a person who's an outdoorsman uh, and who valued that, you know, sort of low impact climbing right from the very start and built the company around that. So there, there was never any, you know, debate about whether or not Patagonia was an environmentally responsible uh, company. That's always been the case. And they've been selling it ever since, right? And now you see these, you know, these ad campaigns like last uh, fall, right? Uh, they had this campaign, don't buy this coat, right? Or, you know, uh, and of course they sold more coats than ever after they've advertised that. But they basically have this little pledge that you can sign up for to not buy things that you don't need. And I think they're gaining something out of that in the sense that the people that work there are incredibly you know, energized by this because they believe it, right? They will go to the ends of the earth because they feel like they're doing something more than just selling outdoor equipment and, and clothing. They believe they're doing something different. And we're not immune, right? The University of Michigan, right? Our, uh, you know, the longest serving president in our history uh, set our goal of, of a pretty high uh, aspiration level of an un uncommon education for the common man, right? And so for me, somebody who comes from Northwestern whose, you know, vision I think is, you know, provide an uncommon education for anybody that has a lot of money that can pay for it, right? This is kind of more motivating, right? I feel better about this as, as a, a mission in life. And I, I can work against my own narrow interests, you know, in, in order to uh, achieve a goal like that that I believe in. The question, though, the thing that troubles me is my higher uh, level purpose and yours may not be the same, but we work in the same organization. So unless you're willing to go down the narrow Patagonia path and say, this is it, you know, like it or leave it, how does one, you know, achieve a, a sense of higher purpose in an organization that's diverse and that has people with, you know, naturally differing uh, views on what they value? Okay. So I, I, I'll, I'll stop it there by asking the question of, does this all shake out to saying, well, that you know, the key challenge, as I said, you're not going to get to positive business without going through operations. If you can't be efficient in operations, you will not be competitive and you will not be in business and story over, right? No positive culture to create. So how does positive business, you know, uh, uh, supplement uh, this pursuit of efficiency? Well, one way is basically aligning incentives, right? The whole sharing, the, the benefits approach, the Henry Ford approach with salary and so forth. Maybe that's one way to go about it. Or is it really that there is some kind of higher purpose? Maybe we need to be focusing on that and less on the financial side of it. Or is it something completely different that I'm just like off the mark entirely? So I would like to hear your thoughts. Any? Please. Mm 
So, so, so you think that that basically this so it sounds to me like you're closest to Joe Hendricks in, in view, right? That that basically we're lining up in terms of what we need to accomplish as, as a business. We're transparent. That people who want to keep their jobs will rally behind that as a call. In terms of a sense of a higher purpose, the higher purpose is to uh, is to meet the needs of all the stakeholders in a win-win way. Ah. And a customer-focused ah. strategy is initiated. Logic of lean production, which reduces the trade-offs okay. between those four major internal nice. metrics. Okay, so that okay. is that hasn't been made clear because that takes, you know, in terms of publishing journal articles, that has to be written from a general systems perspective, sure. whereas all the most of the articles are written in a specialized way. Right. And so, and I see some of that uh, lack of clarity. Is when at first you were going in another direction with the lean production produces these trade-offs. And the general trends you gave of, I think, in, in the U.S., I think mm -hmm. the trends reflect the U.S., but I don't think that lean production is really the cause of the decline in wages and the uh, rising, uh, uh, you know, in relation to rising profits. I mean, we look at it comparatively, the Japanese continued along the, the uh, reducing trade-offs path in the 80s mm -hmm. while the U.S. introduced trade-offs with a lower ad adoption of lean production. So I would say mm -hmm. the lean production... Uh, corresponds more to reducing trade-offs. And the, the trends in the U.S. have a lot to do with the union busting politics, mm -hmm. which inhibited implementation mm -hmm. of lean production to some extent, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other things. And the lean production was, hasn't been uh, implemented as uniformly, so mm -hmm. it didn't mm -hmm. correlate and explain that whole mm -hmm. the larger trend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to imply that somehow lean is at fault, for all of the evils that we've seen there. Indeed, even the authors that are criticizing lean typically go down the path of you're doing it wrong, right? If the workforce is reacting this way, then you're not implementing lean in the right way. I can accept that. But yeah, Jane. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so basically the first two bullet points, the first one is kind of serving self. The second one, what you're saying is that that, that higher purpose may actually be, you know, externally facing as opposed to sort of serving my interests of, you know. Let me ask you, yeah, I like it. Depending on the type of implementation, yes, yes. I mean, so one of the things, you know, in terms of, of, of lean flows is that I'm not supposed to be producing something until you need it, right, if we're, you know, connected together, which mean, forces a level of communication between us, right? So in good lean implementations, there is more of a dialogue uh, between people on the same, uh, you know, level uh, than, you know, in a system where, you know, you, you don't have that kind of pull mechanism that's, that's linking them together. So, but there also are, are studies that point out that that, that um, communication can be negative. It can be stressful, right? You, you, I'm supposed to deliver it just when you need it, so you're communicating me, to me your needs and quality and so forth. Or you're yelling at me and you're making me stressed out because I have to have it to you just when you want it, you know, as opposed to at my pace. So I, I see both things being reported in the, in, in the literature. So, Yes. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, certainly we've been seeing this with the, the Yahoo thing. You can't work at home. Come in and work here, right? Versus the Google approach, which is, you know, we don't care where you work, but we're going to make the workplace so attractive to you, you know, in terms of those kinds of connections and collaborations that you'll come of your own accord. Yeah. Oh, I, I think so. I mean, that, that whole long-term versus short-term perspective is an important one, right? I mean, think, think of us, right? And, you know, back to the efficiency of delivery in, in education, right? Most of us are sitting here thinking, not going to affect me, right? I can do what I do now, and, and for me, that's good enough. Unless I have some kind of vision that, that goes beyond my retirement date, I'm not going to invest in those things. So it has to be something that, in, you know, engages us. Yes, please. Which, which question did I ask? Oh, this one here? Yeah. Well, so, so what you're saying, I think, is, is true, which is that, right, if, if a job can be specified, right, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, an algorithm, it's going to be automated, right? And so what it means is that all of the, the kinds of work that we used to create, you know, for people to do those kinds of tasks is simply not appearing. So if you look at some... some um, you know, statistics in terms of the, the fraction of the workforce in manufacturing over the, the history as the country got richer, right? If you look in the, you know, like the UK and you know, Germany, some of these early countries, a very high percentage of the, the country wound up in manufacturing at one point in their, their development. Now you look at countries like India and China and so forth, basically saying, can we follow that path? And the reality is they'll never get there. They will never get there because all those sort of low produ productivity jobs that we basically built the middle class on aren't there. They're not there in China. They're not there in India, you know, and they're not here. So an interesting question is what then happens, right? I mean, do you just ratchet up the whole educational game? So that, now I'll go back to the, the other point that I'm making about, you know, radical increases in delivery of, of education, Right is that while you may not be too impressed with MOOCs as a threat to your existence here in a premier U.S. university, you know, somebody who's sitting out in one of those countries where they're looking at you know, some way to get out of their, their situation through education, MOOCs are pretty darned attractive, right? And so you're going to see you know, lots of advances in that technology simply because there, there is a huge audience to serve there. Um, but great dilemma. I don't know what the answers are. Diana?
Okay. And so that doesn't hold any interest. Yeah. I mean, I've been to facilities or factories which make portable toilets. Yeah. It's an incredibly lean production system. People see how they are related to the final product going out to the customer. They realize that it's an efficient system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have waste. And they're making portable toilets. Right. I think you're right, and I think going back to the to Joe Henrich's stuff, right? So he had a, a unionized workforce. They're not going to get a penny more in, in financial compensation, and indeed they're going to get less because the overtime is going to be eliminated. And yet, you know, you would always bring in the latest celebration and you know these testimonials from people. They were really proud. I mean, you know, to the point of being in tears, right? That they'd saved this plant because some of these people were. You know, their parents had worked at this plant and so forth, and they had, you know, a real sense of, of, of attachment to it. And that just the, 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 this one, assuming that people want to work. And so what he did is he basically said, your job matters. You're, you're this, you know, uh, whatever, tool runner who's bringing materials to this line, and here is how important you are, right, in terms of, you know, any little disruption here, and we're talking, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars of impact from that. And so people felt more important after they knew that. And whether you're making, you know, F-150 pickup trucks or portable toilets, people still have pride in their work. So there is something to be, uh, you know, mined there. Yes? Right. 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 And that, and that I, I mentioned standardized work is one of the Toyota practices, but it doesn't mean static standardized work, right? The idea is always to challenge it, but then share it, right? So if you come up with an innovation, right, the idea is not for you to keep it so that you can look the best. The idea is to change the standard and so that everybody adopts, you know, the insight that you've had. Um, but, uh, yeah. hand up, yes, please. Yeah, that, that's a great one, right? Is, is positive a, a, about every single person in the organization, or is it about finding some leaders that are going to carry the organization forward and others you know, will follow or participate? Yes? I think you're putting your finger on something I think that is, is pretty important. If we go back to this statistic, uh, where is that graph that I had of the stuff falling apart here? Not me. Uh, this one, okay? Is, is that, you know, if you look at investments in efficiency, things like lean, those pay back very quickly, right? If you look, anybody who's done lean knows that you can make money very quickly by cutting costs and making things more efficiently. Um, on the other hand, investments in longer term, you know, development of new markets, new products and so forth are much slower to pay off, right? So if you have a short term mentality in, in your management approach, then what's going to happen is you're going to rely too much on cost cutting, which is going to lead to this kind of stuff, right? 
less employment, because the, the, in, the innovations in terms of developing markets, products, you know, uh, things that, that really provide, you know, sort of big new value, those are the things that create new jobs, right? So we may be, at least in this country, in a situation where we're, because we have such short uh, time frames that we operate under, we're trying to please Wall Street and so forth and make sure that our numbers look good this quarter, we're emphasizing the short-term efficiency gains over the long-term uh, you know, development and innovation gains, and as a result, we don't have the places to put those people, right? Because if, if, if you just kind of keep serving your same market more efficiently, you're going to be shedding workers. On the other hand, if you're investing in long-term things so you have places for them to go, like you just said, then you have, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the sort of the complement between the two, right? Is that you're developing people to be efficient, but also having places for them to expand into. And so it seems as though those have to go together. Yes? How do you think we achieve that? I mean, you're, you're saying that, that, that it's the responsibility of business to invest in that? Do you have some thoughts on how? Didn't even know it. Um, no, I, I think you're right. I think that some of the technologies that I've been referring to, as I'm not a big fan of, of replacing face-to-face, -face, you know, uh, collaborative education with, you know, distance learning. On the other hand, sort of leveling the playing field. I think that a lot can be done there, right? So, you know, the notion of you need to have financial accounting, you need to have statistics and so forth. We can provide very good self-study modules to help people sort of bring themselves up so that they can enter on a level. Right. Thank you. Yes, please. Which which graph are we talking about? This one? Yeah. See, and that there, I, I, I mentioned, and I didn't come back to it, why is it that Toyota could be copied for 40 years and still maintain their lead, right? And the reason was because of the cultural aspects of it. They transformed the culture into a great big sort of uh, waste elimination, continual improvement machine. And that culture has lots and lots of moving parts, and that's not so easy to copy. Right? That's the long-term benefit. It's not just, I saved this much on you know, this product today. It's that I've created a capability that's going to pay uh, dividends down the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway. So, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your attention and all your excellent comments. And uh, thanks for being here.